just, just yeah, just be yourselves. Be your fantastic selves. Okay, um, I think we're kind of we're getting ready to gear up for the broadcast. So if we could have our, our panelists for today, come on down. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Eliza Bent. I'll be moderating the panel in pursuit of a dark euphoria. Um, since we're broadcasting today, uh, it was encouraged that I introduce each of our panelists with uh, a full bio. So I'm going to quickly move through their bios before we get to the questions. Uh, so to my left here is David Newman. Uh, he is the Artistic Director of Advanced Beginner Group, and his work has been presented I in New York City at The Kitchen, PS122, Dance Theater Workshop, Central Park Summer Stage, and Symphony Space. Um, these are all very important, fancy locations, in case <laughs> you didn't know. Um, also, the, the Walker Center in Minneapolis, Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival in Massachusetts, uh, the Maggie... Alice, 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 National uh, Center of for Choreography, uh, among among many others. Um, uh, as a, a choreographer, he most recently worked on Robert Woodruff's adaptation of Fassbinder's *In a Year with Thirteen Moons* at Yale Rep. And uh, David Newman is also currently on the faculty uh, for the theater de department at Sarah Lawrence College. So, David, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Sybil Kempson, uh, over here in the green, uh, is a playwright uh, living in New York City. Her work has been presented at New York Live Arts, the Chocolate Factory in New York City, Dixon Place, Soho Rep, PS122, Little Theater, Brick Theater, and the Fuse Box Festival in Austin, Texas. She's also had work here at the Great Plains Theater Conference and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Uh, some current collaborations that she's working on is uh, a piece with Elevator Repair Service called Fondly Colette Richard Richland. Um, Big Dance Theater uh, and Sybil collaborated on a piece called Ich Kürbisgeist. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, Danke, Sybil. Um, <laughs> uh, and also, uh, Sybil and David uh, worked together on a piece, uh, Restless Eye, and that was at um, Dance Theater Workshop slash New York Live Arts. It's always a curious uh, title. Um, and one uh, another big collaboration, Sybil, is at the helm of, is uh, River of Gruel, Pile of Pigs, The Requisite Gestures of Narrow Approach, and that's with a group in Austin, um, between the Rudmex and Salvage Vanguard Theater. Uh, so thank you, Sybil. Welcome. Happy to have you on the panel. And last but not least, we have Justin Townsend at the far end in the white t-shirt. And Justin uh, is, a, is a recent Drama Desk winner. Uh, congratulations, Justin. Um, uh, he, Justin is a lighting designer, and his design has appeared on Broadway, including Vanya, Sonia, Masha, and Spike, The Other Place, Bloody Bloody, Andrew Jackson. Uh, he's also worked on some New York shows uh, that have been off-Broadway, such as Here Lies Love, currently running at the Public Theater, uh, Juan and John at the Public, Galileo, and Unnatural Acts, Milk Like Sugar at Playwrights Horizons, Luck of the Irish, and On the Levee at Lincoln Center 3. 
regionally, Justin's work has appeared at the Arden Alliance, ART, Bardscape, Bard Summerscape, Boston Court, Baltimore Center Stage, among many other notable uh, regional uh, locations. Okay. Well then, and I'm Eliza Bent. I'm not just a Joe Schmo that they pulled off the street. Uh, I'm a, a journalist for American Theatre Magazine, uh, as well as a performer and a playwright. Uh, anyhow, moving on. Let's get to the questions of the dark euphoria. So I think it's it's uh, interesting to 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 uh, think of the description of today's panel, which is uh, a new wildness in imagination, form, collaboration rehearsal and production and the spatial challenges that this work brings. Um, just so that we're all on the same page here about what this panel really is. I'd love to maybe just start with defining our terms. What in, in your minds is a dark euphoria and how are you pursuing it? <laughs> uh. <laughs> Feel free to take a liberal stab at that, at that <laughs> question. <laughs> We were saying last night it sounds like a, a, a rum drink. <laughs> I'd like to use it as a drag name. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> um, no. yeah. well, well, it is about a little bit about collaboration. Know the wildness of of collaborating, how we can wildly collaborate. I kept reading wildness as wilderness. So what are, wh what are your takes on collaboration in, in today? I mean, Sybil, you have a ton of collaborations happening at the mm -hmm. moment. Maybe you could kick things off. Yeah, I think for me it's um, about resisting, organiz um, resisting not organizations like institutions, although y it's good to resist those too to a certain extent, but to resist um, over-organizing stuff. Um, I guess uh, it, whenever I'm writing something, and a lot of times when I've performed, if I've been performing something, I am looking for ways of, uh, of problematizing, of making problems where problems may or may not already exist. And so in the collaborations that I'm doing, I guess across the board, if there's anything, th they're all very different, um, but across the board, I think the thing that I, I'm really trying to uh, keep intact is is a, a sort of lack of organization, and um, so that in in some of the projects that the roles that people like um, like the Austin project that I'm working on. I was going to ask about that, yeah. Okay, so we worked, we've been working on it for I think two or three years now, and for the first year and a half, uh, we, we the only thing that had been established would be th was that I would be the one that would be at the computer writing stuff down. And what, uh, and that I would be generating the text, but I also even opened that up um, so that ideas and thoughts and um, good and bad and input associations, image, uh, images um, and different connections between uh, and among material I was bringing in. Um, so that was open to everybody and we didn't have someone who said, I'm going to step up and be the director, I'm going to be the producer, I'm going to design the costumes. And then th we called it a pig pile. And, uh, and how many how many organizations are in this pig pile? Um, there are representatives from four different theater groups in the in the city of Austin, and they they they've um, they've worked a lot as individuals together on each other's work, but they'd never come together before to make a, a piece together. So there are four different ways of working. So like um, the Rude Mex, um, they have I think four or five main original members and and with every show they make and every decision that they make in every single one of those shows they must come to consensus so it's not even democratic where the majority rules they must arrive at consensus and that's right down to the writing and then um salvage vanguard theater is more they'll they'll have guest 
artists and guest shows come in, but they they establish what the what the they'll they'll work within a hierarchical structure. So there'll be a director, and then there's a stage manager and actors, and and it goes from there. Um, Rubber Rep is a, a partnership of two guys, and they collaborate together, sort of as one really crazy organism and then they they bring people in to w collaborate with them and physical plant is uh steve moore's uh and that's that he he's it, it's mostly he's at the nucleus of it and then he brings in collaborators around them so we sort of found our own way of working and um and allowed it to emerge and so that uh, so that the decisions that were being made we were really working to um be very patient and let those decisions sort of make themselves so that um, uh, when, when it was time to choose roles, the roles had already sort of started to happen on their own. And it's, it's a confusing way to work. It can be really frustrating. Um, and it takes a lot of patience and trust. Um, but, uh, but I think it, um, and, and we're still not finished. The piece that we've made, we're still working on it. It's very confusing. We put it all together for the first time um, at the Fusebox Festival this year. And some people loved it, and some people just felt really lost, including myself, which, and I felt both. And so we have another year now to work on it. and. Um, and now roles are established, who's doing what is more or less established, so we'll be able to sort of shape it and, and, and either give it um, like an exoskeleton or a frame or, or find something that uh, holds the whole thing together through the middle, but really working to allow that to come forward on its own rather than deciding ahead of time and imposing, imposing that uh, upon it. Mm -hmm. So if there's whatever's <coughs> darkly euphoric about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with the, the, that idea about um, walking into a process uh, without a predetermined uh, result. I think is an important part of uh, a lot of this work, how this work is made. <coughs> Pardon my voice. Um, and and the other word I was going to bring up is is hierarchy. Uh, an another thing that's resisted is the uh, our traditional hierarchy so that so that the conversation in an effort to make a conversation a little more uh, richer and 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 even uh, less predictable I'll mm -hmm. um, what what was a project that you were recently involved in where the hierarchy was non-traditional or uh well i mean i I think uh, for Restless Eye, for instance, I, mean, I that was the piece you did with Sybil. With Sybil, and uh, another uh, important collaborator on that was Tay Blow, who is a, a sound designer and uh, did video projections, and um, it was an interesting process. Although uh, the piece was initiated by me, and I was I sort of was at the helm uh, in in that way as a cr director and a choreographer. Uh, the way that we worked, I mean, I, I know that Sybil would respond to. She would sit in the room and watch rehearsal and respond to some of the things that were being made and would send writing in response. And then that would inspire me to change what I had <laughs> made. And in and, 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 and those ways, those conversations, uh, uh, we really lost the clear defined boundaries of who made what and who was responsible for what. And, this and the designer, like the lighting designer was involved uh, equally Christine also. Christine Schallenberg, exactly. Yeah, she brought in a very important element um, uh, that com that really radically changed the way uh, uh, the piece was being staged, and we were using these uh, this these things called the neuro sky um, uh, scanners, I guess, and they they take they read the brain waves, and uh, she found a way to take that information and and have it affect the lighting, so that so that uh, the brain waves of the performers were uh, uh, affecting. Uh, the intensity of the lighting and even the, the direction of, of of one of the intelligent lights where it was facing on the stage. So that was uh, a, a stochastic, a sort of a random kind of uh, uh, event was happening while the piece was going on. I, is is that then part of the the, the 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 darkness question? The the lack of ownership. Is that is that sort of what the into the darkness is 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 is, is uh, the wildness? The the uh, uh, is that uh, is it the, the releasing of that? Is that is that what is it is, is it important in that in that conversation? I would think, yeah, so. I think so because it's it's the part <coughs> that the part that isn't organized, the part that isn't predictable, and so um, and that that confusion that you have to sort of go into when things 
aren't as organized. And when you have a hierarchy, it's, it's really simple. And in a lot of ways, it's easier because everyone knows what their role is and they, know they have a job and it's really defined. Um, but then, like, like uh, working on David's piece, I had a really crazy idea about a sound thing. And I said, well, I'm just, I know this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be writing, you know, written text. And so, but I ended up working on this sound piece anyway, and it ended up getting used in the, in the piece, which wouldn't have happened if, if in a regular situation, if um, you're not the sound designer, you know, and of course I did a terrible <laughs> job. Thanks, Sybil, that's great. Uh, that's um, <laughs> we'll consider yeah, that. But, 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 but then how does it happen? I mean, you know, the question then, and I think, that, that, and, and we, we have our own ideas, but I'm, I'm curious to share is, is how then, if we all can do whatever the heck we want, isn't it great? Well then, where is the there there? How do we eventually come to this consensus, or how does it actually merit into something that we want to put in front of our peers and say, "Hey, what do you think? We actually made something." I, you know, well, I, I, yeah, I would like. H how has it worked for in your experience, Justin? Um, y you know, collaboration for me is a funny thing, right? I mean, th 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 they're for, uh, I'm, I'm always amazed by the rude mechanicals to hear about them say, "Yeah, we all we all circle our hands and say yes, we agree," and I'm, I'm sure that's not what happens. Um, uh, uh, but to some degree about that, I've been in a situation where best idea rules, and, th and then we sort of know the, 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 the sort of the, the, the Ouija board of, 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 of idea making, or sort of call, we, we know, uh, you're pushing, you're pushing, uh, um, uh, but as soon as it the, the group starts moving that direction, we can call out yes, indeed, uh, or ask again, uh, <coughs> perhaps. Um, uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I mostly trust putting it up on stage and testing it. That, that, that I, uh, we, we can sit here for days and talk about all of our lovely staging ideas and I want to write a play about or I want to I wanna do this thing, but until Sybil brings in the lousy sound cue that's, that, that's earth shattering, that no one ever thought about, that we're all sort of having lovely ideas. Uh, and so it's, it's that action, and, and I, I'm always curious what manifests that action, what, what manifests that, how do we get to the, I was just thinking about this sound thing, so I brought it. You know, and, and who knows if it's good or not. Uh, our, our, our teammates can have it, but but what manifests that initial impulse? What is that taste or that that uh, that that that? This is what I want. Mm -hmm. This is how I get to. And and that's what I'm I'm sort of interested in in, in pursuing or chasing is identifying uh, that spark, that unique spark, uh, as opposed to I like red. Well, we all like red. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think it's I think it's like uh, I think it's very. Um, impulsive and and it's it's one of those things where i i feel like this belongs here and i don't know why but i it just is right here for some reason and i feel that i could be wrong so you're approaching with sort of um you're laying something out on the table and saying this feels right to me what does this feel like to you guys? And then you try it, right? Because that's one of the first rules of collaboration is somebody brings in an idea. You don't poo-poo it until you try it. And then if it feels right to everybody else, then you keep it. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't, then you talk about, well, where did that come from? And But um, I've been, okay, so I've been reading, um, I've been reading for a long time a lot about, <laughs> David knows all about this, I've tortured him, but a lot about chaos theory um, in physics. And it's the part of physics that they, you know, they started looking at in the 70s where um, they're looking at stuff like turbulence and um, stuff that can't be measured that physicists have traditionally just sort of swept under the carpet because they can measure it, but why bother? Because we can't predict or control turbulence so why should you know why why would we mess around so they really started looking at it and um and there's a couple of physicists that are writing um that have been writing like in the last 10 or 15 years and they've also done a lot of work with native american cultures interestingly enough to find where um where uh our, our recent advances in modern physics intersect with the Native American worldview, and it's actually really surprising. They're coming at it from completely different directions, but in a lot of cases, they're coming to the same conclusions. And so they talk about um, the patterns that are implicit in nature and the way um, the way things are made, however you, however we, you know, subjectively feel that that happens. That there are patterns at work, and that there's patterns at work in um, behavior of groups of human beings um, that uh, are disorganized, that we, 
that aren't easily predictable and that aren't controllable. And it's the kind of thing that happens when children are playing together. They don't always make rules and say, you're going to be the boss and we're going to follow you. And they're not, they're not deciding ahead of time, but they're making actual like creative decisions. And somehow it's, it, it, it finds, they call it, um, there's a point of bifurcation and amplification. That's the point where somebody, one person starts just doing something and then other people start gathering around that action. It's not even a decision. It's, it's, or maybe it is. You decide to start doing this, but it's not based on a committee that decided this is what we're going to do. So you just start doing something and then others gather around it and then it, um, they're not really sure how it happens, but suddenly it's happening. It's like the hundredth monkey. All of a sudden everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're not really sure why or how, but I, that's what I'm interested in. And I guess if we're talking about the dark euphoria, this, this sort of dicey area where stuff happens that we don't decide ahead of time, for me, I do, it, it's just about like stepping back and saying, I, I'm going to allow something to happen here. And inevitably it does. Huh. Something happens. Whether it's in time for your deadline or not is another question. Yeah. Like we got done with that Restless Eye piece and we were talking the other day. It was like the show, having the production sort of ruined the our the research. Process. It was like <laughs> shut it down, shut down yeah. our process. We couldn't yeah. rehearse anymore because the show was up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Peter Cassander, uh, uh, a, dear, a colleague, uh, says uh, he calls it a heavily researched gut instinct. And, and I like that, that combination, yeah. right. that, yeah. that, that yeah. idea that, that we have to be of, of the most knowledgeable to trust that uh, something will come up. Yeah, it, it's inter and also this uh, notion about the way that children play and studying the, wa the ways in which children play. I, um, when I'm not a, a journalist, I um, uh, perform with a group called Half Straddle, and we're a company, we're an ensemble, and we have a very peculiar way of going about business, and often it resembles somebody telling somebody else how to say a line and well no why don't you stand over there and then somebody kind of fooling around and doing a weird gesture and then the weird gesture gets put into the play somehow and it it ultimately feels a bit like like we're messing around and we're in somebody's basement and we're 13 mm -hmm. um so but something ends up happening i mean i've seen those shows oh, and so much happening that couldn't happen if someone said if someone tried to envision what would happen right. ahead of time yeah well, I guess maybe that ne leads to my next question, and we've kind of touched on this, but what, in your opinions, do you feel is is essential about collaboration? I mean, obviously, hierarchies work well. There's a reason why why these hierarchies usually exist with, or maybe not even usually, but sometimes exist with director, playwright, actor. Um, so what do you feel theater gains when you collaborate in this, in this uh, darkly euphoric way? Well, I mean, for me, I, I do trust a little bit of hierarchy, and I like when the baton gets tossed, uh, uh, passed. I, I don't think it needs to be only one person. And, and I, I worry, because I, I worry, I, I do, I worry, I, I worry about uh, mobs of people uh, telling me what the right answer is, um, uh, inherently. So the idea that, that we can, w that, that there might be pr someone who says, no, this is the right idea, even if it isn't the person we traditionally know, I, I, I respect and am excited by. Because I, I do think there needs to be something brought to the table that uh, when work is being made, uh, sometimes we just sprint one direction, and that may be enough to, to, to initiate, uh, initiate something. I really just personally, for me, I just love the feeling of having made something and feeling like I can't take credit for it. For some reason, that feeling is so satisfying to me, and... I often feel like it's like that will be the thing that saves me from going to hell or something <laughs> like that I can't like that I won't be the one taking credit for all of the stuff that I've <laughs> made. But it's that's very personal. So I w what is what is there to be gained? I that's that's an open question. I think that's a question everyone would answer for themselves like whether it's their thing or not. Yeah. I don't think it's for everybody. It can be really frustrating to work that way, and it can be really frustrating to see the stuff that's made that way for some folks, and for some, some folks really love it, so. And I think it depends on the, <coughs> uh, the type of work one is after. I, I, I think this process leads to a certain kind of work, and I, I enjoy the collaborative process because of the, because of the rehearsal process itself, the way that authorship is shared and, and the kind of permission that brings to the room, everyone gets 
it's a chance. The brain trust grows then, and and with time, the 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 decision making gets a, l a little more specific with experience. It's like an improv group. You you know, uh, in, in in the dance world, um, uh, to improvise with a group of people seems sort of you can just do it, but um, actually the, the the most effective kinds of uh, improvisations uh, require months and months of rehearsal. Uh, and it is it is also related to play. I I you know I love making theater and uh, I want to have fun doing it. And so this is a way of working with colleagues and friends that uh, uh, who inspire me that, that and, and and we can have a great time in a way not just f not just fun like a frivolous sense but like rich enriching fun right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my mind is spinning. I'm sure everyone in the group also has some questions that they'd like to ask. Um, uh, shall we open it up to the qu Boston? Christopher has a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're recording. Is this on? Is this on? <laughs> yeah, good. Um, so wha what I'm curious about is how, after going through sort of the dark euphoria, <laughs> um, that you might take the same approach in a collaboration, I think Justin was touching on this a little bit maybe, but in terms of like how you would then apply that to the more traditional structure and can you apply those same rules or at least open up that sort of, you know, release some of the pressure of that using some of these skills and have you been able to do that and maybe an example of how that might have worked um, in terms of the way people think. I, I would say uh Right off the bat, I, I think it's very possible inside of a, uh, a more traditional hierarchical stru structure for these these dynamics to exist, and I, I, I think it does depend on the people in the room, uh, the 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 producing organization or institution that can allow uh, that kind of dialogue, and I think more and more uh, people are moving in that direction. I, I recently worked with the director Robert Woodruff at Yale Rep, and it's pretty amazing that a regional theater would give a ton of money based on a Fassbinder film, uh, a very dark, um, brutal piece of, uh, uh, of work. And, um, you know, it was an enormous production. And the way that Robert worked is he came in with a lot of really clear ideas. He had to. It was a, a, a four-week schedule. So we had to adapt a, a, fe a you know, feature-length film for the stage in a just a few weeks. I mean, uh, wh when I worked on Restless Eye, it was two years, two and a half years to develop it off and on. Uh, so, but what he was able to do was, was create something of that, of that nature, of a collaborative nature. He, he asked the opinion of just about everyone in the room uh, when, uh, about decisions he was making as a, as a director, um, even on the design uh, and costumes and set and everything else, inside that very rigid, rigid hierarchy that, that uh, with which uh, Yale Rep works. I found that really inspiring. I, I think as a lighting designer, I try and work very agilely and very um, quickly. Uh, it's similar to the way an actor might work in the first rehearsals. So trying to figure out, instead of how to paint the painting that we all will now think, well, that's pretty, it rather to how can my work affect the action and participate as a scene partner? So that all of a sudden, there's this big energy in the room, and it might affect how things move. Or, or you know, maybe it's wrong, and I turn that off. But so that I'm constantly providing and challenging what has already known in the in the hall and moving it into performance, so that um, uh, and you know sometimes people just want me to you know, sort of get out of the way and make sure I can see them, and uh, yeah, that's all right. You know we, we do that kind of those kind of plays sometimes, and 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 sometimes there needs to be an agile uh, way of looking at uh, 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 well what is it what is the event that we're making, and and there is some more momentum to that, and I think that's where. I, I, I like to be the most is, is offering. Well, it could be like this, or what about this? And, and, and instead of talking about it, again, putting it up on its feet and saying, well, here's a big light through the door. Oh my gosh, well now you're entering in over there, it's much better. Um, I, even though we've been rehearsing it for four weeks the other way. Uh, that, that, that simply seeing, seeing an architecture and seeing time and space happen in front of us, um, hopefully there's a group of, of folks that I'm working with who can, can, can nimbly adjust or say, oh, Justin, get out, get out of the way, you're, it's weird. I think it could be something as simple as just um, having more awareness for, ev like, if you're in one role, 
um, or one job in a, in a production, um, having more awareness and just developing more of a sense of responsibility toward, in some way, everything that's happening. Um, and and that's, that's what I've been working on trying to sort of engender with the elevator repair service project that I'm working on because they're, they, they make work together, but, um, but there's one guy in charge who really makes the decisions and there's a lot of group generating stuff. But um, mostly, you know, there, 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 happen there happens like this uh, feeling of passivity that people are being waiting, wait, waiting to be told, where do I go? How do I do this? What do I do? And maybe taking more initiative along along those lines, and um, maybe opening up awareness to what what is that lighting guy up to, and what is this? You know, what what are the signs that we are making? What are we saying by? Um, what does this line actually say? What does this mean if I stand this this close to this actor instead of over here? And you know, you're uh, you're at the risk of becoming a little bit of a pain in the ass to the director, but I think that if you're just um, bringing questions to the table and an awareness to the table, that um, you're 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 all, and if you're also willing to take on more responsibility for the thinking about what are we. What are we saying? What are people signing up for when they come and see this show? Um, and starting a dialogue, um, and, and that's a, that's a small adjustment, but I think that 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 could be a good way to to bring it into the the regular way of doing it. Hi, hello. Um, I'm curious about the ways in which you've uh, or some collaborative skills you've developed over time that you may not have had five or ten years ago, um, and what are the areas in which you still have room to grow as a collaborator? What are you working on? Well, I think that's what's so great about doing collaborations, that there's always, you never become an expert at it. There's never, like, um, John Collins, the, the, the artistic director of Elevator Repair Service who I've been working with, has been getting so mad lately about people are, everyone's talking about devised theater. It's the new, like, latest thing. Everyone's talking about it. It's getting all this new funding and all this new recognition. <coughs> and he gets so mad when people start throwing that term around because, he feels like by giving it a, 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 a label like that, that we're standardizing it as a way of making theater. And he really uh, is balking against the idea that there could, that that is like one way, there's, that there could be one way of doing it. Um, and so I think that you're constantly learning because every time you step into a new group, your process is gonna be as different as are the people in this group from the last group that you worked with. So it's, it's um, you're constantly learning because you're constantly working with new groups of people or even if you're working with the same group of people, a group of people changes over time. And so you're adjusting whatever your practice is and your process is with the passage of time and, and, and with everyone else's development as well. So you're constantly having to grow and, um, and expand your thinking and I think Mostly, I, I've just learned how to work with people, which is a lot of people don't know how to do that. And I think most peop theater people do, but if you go outside of theater, um, in, in a lot of cases, people have trouble working together and, and dealing with other people. So it's, uh, I mean, theater in general is, is good training for that, I think. I thought immediately uh, about one thing that I've, I've gotten much better at is listening. And and one thing that still needs improvement is listening, <laughs> and that's uh, that and that, that really is uh, sums it up in a maybe a too cute way, but but that really is true. Yeah, I um uh, I li li listening is a, is is uh <coughs> yeah I, I agree absolutely as a, a sort of fundamental piece, and uh, the other the other response that I keep coming back to is 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 improv 101, but but it, it's a continued reminder of of the yes and the 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 how can I can it, 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 the most offensive or most upsetting or or downright wrong idea how can I open my heart to it uh, and and that and that moment I think is when there's sort of grace in the air when we sort of say okay let's move. Um, uh, and and maybe in a different way than I uh, s w expected to, and and I find that that's where the the the, the, the surprising the, the the surprise turn happens, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or the uh, the oh yes and then and then it allows the hook back that that I was trying to find. But until 
it, it's those those two energies deciding to move together or three or five that starts to uh, um, create momentum. And I think in the in the individual, it's a willingness to let go of your idea as the right idea. At like my way is the right way, and why won't why won't you guys see it my way? And and to be willing to, <laughs> to like <laughs> just really let that go. And it's so it's so painful, but it's it's so great when you when you can do it. When you can just be like, well, all right, <laughs> okay, let's toss it. Or it's interesting too, because like I. I feel like I work in a fairly collaborative manner, but a, a play of mine that recently had a production in New York, um, I, I was amazed. One of the actors one day, we were talking about an idea. The director was kind of describing what, what it was that we were going to try. And the actor said, I know my problem with that idea is, and I kind of blurted out, I said, before you talk about your problem with the idea, let's try the idea. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, I, I think that's always sort of an interesting thing. And, and, it's, and it's really dealing with, with people and the individuals in the room and clearly this particular actor w wasn't so used to to trying stuff out i guess which was strange but um anyhow what are the other questions that people have um do you, do you guys having uh worked with a number of different uh companies <laughs> and and around the country and 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 having friends and people who are doing different types of darkly euphoric new <laughs> work. Um, do you guys recognize or spot any sort of um, maybe social, uh, economic, generational energies that seem to be, there seems to be a little bit of a wave kind of happening. And I, I'm just curious if, of your observations of what might I have been noticed, I feel like it's tied to the economy crashing a little bit, not a little bit, but a lot. And um, I, I, I've been going to a lot of talks of artists who were making art um, in the 70s when in New York when times were really tough and talking about the transition from making work in that era to the 1980s when all of a sudden everyone was making a lot of money and how there was so much less interest in art and all of a sudden funding was really scarce and you had to make a piece you know make it already and then they'll tell you whether they're gonna have you at their venue or not and um, but there's no there's no help to develop a piece and um, and when I moved to New York it was the mid 90s and there was a res recession happening there was so much great work it was such a great time to be there and of course there were no like I had a really hard time finding a day job and I didn't have any money but there there was I it was it seemed to be kind of exploding. Like everyone that I, the everything that I went to go see uh, seemed so rigorous and had so many wonderful ideas behind it and was ex everything was like exploding something. Um, and then the internet happened. And again, then it sort of, people were saying this, you know, the internet saved our generation, you know, from poverty. But I think it also destroyed a lot of the art making that was happening or a lot of the, um, mm the rigor and the focus of the art making that was happening and the and and great work was was more scarce and i watched it happen and then now we've had this economy crash again and it's looks to me like it's the best thing that could have happened at least for the art world and that's kind of across the board um, because suddenly everything that i'm going to see is an incredible piece of work and um and that's in New York, and I don't know, I haven't heard a lot of people say that in other cities that I've visited, but um, I, I've, seen it, I've seen it happen, and I've also heard about it happen um, from those artists from, from the 70s into the, into the 1980s. And I don't know why. I, I sense um, a, a, a resurgence of a kind of a DIY approach, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I think that's where that, that term devised theater uh, although that that was around has been around I think for a while, but that sense of um, I I can't find work or get produced or enter into the uh, the traditional commercial theater, so I'm going to do it myself, and I and I get a sense of that happening a lot more now. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I w we've, we've we've heard it talked about, and I and I, I uh, before, and I, I think it is something that should be brought up too, though, uh, Kevin, is is to say that I I think that uh, as I watch uh, newer generations behind me come behind, I I think they're dealing with a lot of student loans that someone has told them they need to have uh, to to enter into this business. So I, I'm really uh, aware of um, a lot more money or a lot more debt being put on um, for mm -hmm. for theatrical education, which means uh, a less nimble uh, generation as they try and figure out how to pay first for these uh, these expenses and then start to make work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's th that's something I'm, I'm uh, great I, I, I'm aware of and checking uh, as we figure out how um, how we support our younger artists too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well we have a, a few more minutes uh, one uh, yeah uh, four more minutes. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we have time for one more question. Ron Zank had his Ron hand up. Oh another. Is it on? <laughs> Is it on? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a friend who's a songwriter. He works with a the guy who does all the the musical backup in Nashville, and they have a friend who does all the mixing in New Zealand. The question is. What's the future of collaboration in an internet world, in an interconnected world, from your perspective, and how do you think it might work in the theater? Well, I recently saw a show. Sorry to. Can I take this one? Well, I recently, <laughs> I recently saw a show in uh, in Austin, and it was done by a, a British theater maker, uh, but he, uh, the it was a very strange performance. It was about twenty minutes long, and the, it was an audience of two, so it was almost not even a, a regular play in, in a sense, but it was an audience of two, and the two audience members had to sit facing each other, and there were screens in front of our faces, and the actor, so to speak, in, in the piece was uh, a man in China who had worked in an Apple computer factory and suffered terribly from the various factory conditions there. And it was sort of his story, and it was a sort of back and forth narration between uh, the, uh, the audience listened in these headsets. And so you'd hear the British man speaking, but then you'd also see the man in China waving on Skype and telling his story, and there were subtitles. So that was, I mean, I think that's part of the future, is certainly having like uh, Skyped and teleconferenced uh, performance styles. It, I, I actually am thrilled in a bizarre way that we have all these technologies because I think it'll be the savior of our business in the sense that our gathering together in a room and hearing each other becomes somehow more important if we spend our days hooked up to these screens. And so we may or may not use them successfully or unsuccessfully. I'm not really worried about that. But I do know that um, gathering, uh, gathering in rooms to hear stories will somehow be a strangely unique thing that um, will be, uh, I, I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. I know a guy named um, Whit McLaughlin. He lives in Philadelphia, and he has a company called uh, New Paradise Laboratories. And uh, he he was a teacher of mine when I was in high school, and he's still, he's still making work. But he's been making internet theater, and he's talked to me about it a bunch. And for some reason, I don't, <coughs> I think I need to be in the room with people, and it might be because I live in a place where there's plenty of people that I can be in a room with. There's a lot of people living there to work with, so I don't need to do internet theater. But um, his argument is, is that we have to start making theater, <coughs> like on Facebook, for example, because before Facebook gets completely taken over by advertising and marketing and corporate interests, that we have to, um, as artists, take hold of it and start making artwork um, so that it exists, so that it stays uh, as um, a, a medium that belongs to everybody, so that it doesn't just become about marketing and advertising. Um, and so, making stuff uh, for Facebook that people are looking at it and they're not really—I mean, I interpret it as you make something and I'm looking at it and I can't decide what it is. I can't easily discern discern what it is, what the post is, or who the person is, or, um, and he's doing crazy things, like you go and you get an, a different identity, 
and then you show up at a party wearing this badge and that's your, like these things the a lanyard but it's not your name it's someone else's name and it's this internet personality that you have donned so it becomes like a video game but then they have they'll have like a party and people show up and and it's like a masquerade ball because people know you as this other person and i i don't know what the implications are or how that's going to play out but that's that that's one idea anyhow well, that sounds like at the perfect end of a dark euphoria conversation, the internet masquerade. So <laughs> onward, pursue it. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it has to be something. I feel the bio.